we're going to talk about a very serious subject, uh, gun violence. Um, as someone who uh, used to be the public information officer for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, ATF, I did not realize the ins and outs and the political lightning rod that guns had in America. Uh, until I really went to work for ATF. And there are so many facets and so many different avenues to the story, but at the end of the day, gun violence needs to be addressed once and for all within our communities. I know so many Detroit police officers that they are just broken each and every day because gun violence within our cities and among our kids as well, mm -hmm. um, it's just been devastating to our communities. And to talk a little bit more, let's bring in Dr. Chris Smith. He is a board chairperson with the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. We've had some heartbreaking headlines here recently here uh, within the metro uh, Detroit area in that kids are getting their hands on more and more guns because we know more kids are at home right now due to the pandemic and not being in their uh, schools. Uh, one thing we should start off in letting people know, get a gun lock. Yeah, I mean, safe storage is an important issue. Um, too often, I think some of the discussions and debates um, sort of drift into a yes, no realm of you're trying to take away my guns, you know, versus uh, some other vision of some simple solution. And in fact, there's a lot of complexity, there's different facets of this, but as you note, uh, safe storage is an important one, and it's one that I think ought to get broad agreement across the spectrum. How do we keep guns away from kids? And we are seeing Kim Worthy, uh, the prosecutor in Wayne County. She has been an advocate. She is holding parents responsible when uh, these shootings happen within their homes. But when we come to the overall argument of gun rights and gun laws, this is a very gray area. And I will say I didn't understand the complexities until I went to work for ATF. Well... You know, I've taught the Second Amendment for 35 years. Um, it's less gray than people make it out to be. You know, 2008, the Supreme Court for the first time said there's an individual right to own firearms. They had never said that the Second Amendment means that before. And they said it in the context of a case where the ruling was law-abiding adults have a constitutional right to keep a handgun in the home for self-protection. The definition of the right as it stands today is actually very limited. Um, they may expand it, but it's actually very limited. And Justice Scalia, who's a gun owner and a hunter and a conservative who wrote the opinion, he also said, and I'll quote here, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. In other words, the right is limited and all of the other things people are able to do, concealed carry, taking it into certain public places, buying certain types of weapons. Those are all policy choices that we can legally discuss and consider adjusting. So we could have an entire show on this topic, by the way, but uh, for time's sakes, one of the things we should also note when we're talking about the Second Amendment, um, when it was written, there are so many various different guns now some people would say and i want to make it clear um it, you know fully automatic is different than semi-automatic and when you're even just talking about a gun and the gun parts what actually makes it a weapon and uh, the big thing now we just had a big bust here in uh, the city of detroit with ghost guns um so that's a completely different topic because it is legal for people 
to build their own gun um, as well. And, 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 and so you, you come into these policies where you have these agencies that are kind of limited as to what they can do because of the laws and the gray area. But in the middle of all of this, people are dying. Yeah, and I mean, what you point to is that, of course, we're also a society where, you know, we're having continuous technological changes, and yep. those technological changes affect the development and nature of firearms, and people use those technologies to find a space that's outside of the way some law was written years ago, you know, whether you're using 3D printers for parts or whatever you're doing. So, I mean, it, it, like other areas, it's a dynamic area, but because of kind of the ideological division, it's hard to think in policy terms about what can we accomplish and agree on in order to keep up with the developments in the world. And 2020, was not a good year, as you point out, with the pandemic increasing um, gun violence. I mean, we don't want to say there's a simple cause to it, but we do know there are employment issues, there's school issues, there's you know people not engaged in the same programs and whatever. Um, it's a dynamic changing situation and we really need to be able to talk about these things in order to think about, not that there is a solution, but how can we make adjustments that might save some lives? Dr. Chris Smith with us here on the Megacast. He's the board chairperson for the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Um, and when we talk about this, gun violence is so prevalent in some of our inner city communities, but yet it's the headlines of the mass shootings that stops the country and reinvigorates the conversation around gun violence. But at the end of the day, what is actually changing? Because I will tell you, I thought listening to the kids from um, Florida, when they were talking about going through the trauma that they went through, they were so passionate and they were so well-spoken. If change was going to happen, it was going to change and happen then. But here we are, it doesn't change. And at the end of the day, criminals are still going to get the guns. Well, part of our task is just to try to make that a little more difficult. Um, and there are certain kinds of crimes where someone is enraged and they acquire a firearm and they march out and do harm on that day or on the next day where slowing down that process may be able to slow down the impact of that rage. But the other thing um, is two thirds of firearms deaths in the United States are suicides, yep. two thirds. And, and that's those what are, we don't talk about, right? And those are very heavily white males and very heavily in rural and small town areas. And so if we thought more broadly about all the different dimensions of this problem, then we can think about maybe some specific adjustments we might make that we can agree on in a broad way um, and get a start on this. But of course, the partisan politics of it is also in the way, you know? Um, and we have a couple recent examples we can see the House of Representatives in Congress has passed this uh, bill to strengthen background checks. There's a big question about whether it can make it through the Senate. And we also saw in Virginia uh, where the legislature changed uh, the, who was in control and the legislature aligned with the governor and they enacted in Virginia, which used to be a source state for all kinds of things because their, their regulations were so loose, they aligned with the governor to create a list of new laws attempting to advance gun safety. So there is a partisan politics dimension that gets in the way too. So with that, um, uh, Dr. Smith, do you think in this administration, because if it didn't happen in the Trump administration, 
Do you think it's going to happen in this administration that um, both sides can come together to make at least baby steps in this conversation? Well, this is this is the hope of what they're working on now, because the baby step has to do with background checks, you know, which is really a limited kind of incremental development when you talk about all the kinds of proposals people float. I just read an article recently that traced national public opinion polls from 2019 to today, including polls by Fox News, including polls by the Wall Street Journal, as well as Washington Post, what have you. In every poll, they have the American public supporting stronger background checks, 83% to 90% in every poll. So if there's any issue where perhaps we can start with this baby step of consensus, it ought to be background check. And we are seeing or hearing that there is some bipartisan conversation going on in the Senate to try to find a way to strengthen background checks, maybe not as much as what the House passed in their bill, but this is really the particular policy issue that tests us to see if we can get a conversation and take a step by working together. So when we talk about the background uh, checks, it's uh, commonly referred to as a NICS check, which is the National Instant Criminal Background Check. So if you go in to legally purchase a gun, you go into a you know a gun store or another um, uh, Walmart or Dick's or whatever, and you're buying some type of firearm, they do a NICS check. Now, typically, if I'm going in to get a background check, I know I'm going to pass, right? The, there are so many loopholes, though. It, some people are going to argue this is not about the check, uh, the NICS check and the background checks. It's about the loopholes because I can sell to you as a private person to you now we can uh, people can be convicted of straw purchasing which is so rare but it's not unusual for an individual who knows that i can't i'm a convicted felon so i can't purchase a gun legally so i'm going to send you in who you're a drug addict on the corner of eight mile and you know whatever i'm going to go in i'm going to give you a hundred dollars i'm going to take you uh, to the you know to the store and you're going to buy that gun so we know that there are these loopholes. Shouldn't the focus be more on trying to close some of the loopholes? Because criminals are going to get guns. We're not so concerned about people who can pass a background check to get the gun because they're the ones that typically are the more responsible gun owners. So what's being done to try to address the illegal pipeline into the illegal gun trade. So let me just add some nuance to your comments because I know you have a lot of knowledge and actual experience on this. The House bill not only seeks to close the so-called gun show loophole, it also uh, seeks to impose background checks on private sales and to force the involvement of licensed dealers in those private sales. And then the second bill seeks to close the Charleston loophole where people would be able to get the firearm if the background check wasn't finished in three days, which is what happened in the yeah. mass shooting in Charleston, where if there had been more time, he might have been denied uh, that. So the House bill seeks to do that, and that's what the conversation is going on in the Senate where I think there's some objection to including private purchases, but maybe closing the gun show aspect, maybe extending the time a little bit, we'll see. But you know, one study of gun purchasers uh, found that 22% of gun purchasers did not go through background checks because private sales are so yep. prevalent. And just as a matter of sort of empirical I'm going to add some nuance to what you say. We don't know how many straw purchases occur. We just know it's hard to find and prove. And that's why you have, as you say, relatively rare that they actually catch somebody um, and, uh, and find out uh, that it happened. 
Um, this is not a cure for anything, but an, another um, bit of data that I read, in the past 25 years, three million people have been caught in the background check system trying to purchase who should not purchase because every purchaser is not sophisticated about their prohibition. Dr. Chris Smith with us here on the MegaCast. He's a board chairperson for the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. We could uh, do an entire hour on the show, uh, so we so appreciate um, your point of view, but also your expertise on this issue. And we should point out, anyone out there, if you have a firearm in your home, please, please make sure that it is locked. Um, you can get free gun locks from pretty much any law enforcement agency across the state of Michigan. I know that at one point in time, Sheriff Bouchard's deputies were carrying them in their vehicles, but you can go in, you do not have to register. No one is tracking whether or not you have a gun, but please, we know so many more kids are home right now because of remote learning and they can have access to these guns. And I know a Detroit police officer who um, has had to work some of these tragic cases and there is a mental toll that it takes on them as well. So please, 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 doesn't matter what side of the argument uh, you are on, lock up your guns and secure your guns. So Dr. Chris Smith, thank you again for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you uh, for raising this issue and being an informed voice on some of the problems involved here.